before we start today's episode, we have some big news to share. Crime After Crime has been picked up by a major podcast production company. We're really excited to be joining their network and welcome to any new listeners that may have just found us. John, did you read the memo about the show? (laughs) Danielle. You know how many shows I produce. I don't have time to read every little piece of paper that comes across my desk, but I did cash that check. Well, our new bosses are making some changes. What? Danielle, what the hell is that music? You should have read the memo, John. Well, okay, but at least we're still here to talk about true crime. Yeah. Nope. What? Well, we're now a corporate accounting podcast. Need to know how to balance both your work life and those general ledgers? I'm Danielle Hallen, and welcome to Dime After Dime. Hey, hey, CPAs. D- Dime After... Did you just say a catchphrase? What, what, what about today's episode? The ganja made me do it. Today's episode is now the internal compliance director made me audit it. Plus, stick around for our water cooler talk segment, where we'll be discussing how your department might be spending too much time on compliance work, not focusing enough on advisory services. Hold on a second. Today's April 1st. Happy Happy April April Fools, Fools, everybody. everybody. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's start the real show now. Although I will say Dime After Dime is equally as catchy. <laughs> yeah. That's our next show. Dime After Dime. <laughs> Could you imagine me in that kind of corporate world talking um, about finances? <laughs> I thought you did pretty good there for a moment. I was I was ready to roll with it. I don't hey, picked up by a major podcasting company. Whatever ask, you guys want us to do. Ask me for your next infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> You did have a little bit of a infomercial feel on that, but I liked it. Uh, great work, Danielle. We hope that you guys enjoyed our little fake out intro for April 1st. <laughs> Hopefully you're having some fun with your friends or family members in a similar way. Um, but we're getting to uh, the real episode now. And yes. to do that, we've got to get through voting results with Danielle for the last episode quarantine crimes. Now, Danielle told the story of a man who infiltrated a closed section of Disney World for his YouTube channel, and I told the story of a mayor who was enforcing stay-at-home orders when his wife was caught at a bar. Danielle, how did it shake out? All right, now I personally loved both of those stories, but when we left it to you guys, on the Twitter poll, I received 72% of the votes and John, 28%. And then the website poll was pretty much the same with me at 70% and John at 30%. Wow, Danielle. Well, congratulations. And let me just say one thing I'm always happy about, if you add those numbers together, 100% of the people enjoyed the episode. So I can't can't be too (laughs) bummed about that, but I do have to hand over... The crime after crime mug. So here you go. There oh, you go. Thank Excellent you. handoff. Beautiful yeah. exchange. <laughs> yeah. And if uh, if you find a little sleeping pill residue in there, I don't know how that got in there. I, mm, I, interesting. Yeah. I just Honestly, I I'll probably enjoy it. <laughs> I, 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 I'm so serious. I never sleep. I have to use ZQL. It might as oh. well sponsor my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's, uh, let's put that out there. Uh, sponsors. We're looking for a sponsorship. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Uh, Well, today's topic is not going to be related to accounting, Danielle. It's the ganja made me do it. Today, we're looking into stories where marijuana plays a significant role in a crime. And I do want to say we're not endorsing or condoning. If it's legal in your state, whatever. I just I just want to yeah. put out a fair thing. We're talking about crimes that have to do with marijuana. I don't think you're going to find any real trend of us being on any side of any fence on it. So Yeah. And on that note, in the U.S., recreational use of marijuana is now legal in 14 states. So we have Alaska, Arizona, California, Colorado, Illinois, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Montana, Nevada, New Jersey, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. Also, several other states are currently allowing medicinal use, which in some cases makes it as easy as complaining to a doctor about your back aches or your headaches, and then you get your card, and pretty much then you're off to Weed World to pick up your prescription. So that's kind of how it's looking across the U.S. As far as I know, there's two states, I think in particular, 
that um, have no medicinal as well. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So. Yeah. And as with any other substances, legal or not, marijuana frequently finds its way onto police reports and court charges. And today we're looking into two stories that will have you shaking your head and maybe even shaking your fists. Yeah. We're kicking off today's <clears throat> episode with Danielle's story first. So Danielle, give it to us. All right, so it isn't anything abnormal to hear of someone being arrested in relation to marijuana, whether that be possession, distribution, or otherwise. However, as we just spoke about, over the last decade, mostly, more and more states have legalized marijuana in a handful of different circumstances. But even then, some only allow medical marijuana cards, some actually only allow CBD oil, which I found interesting. And this has led to more complicated and interesting situations, especially because it is still technically illegal on a federal level. Now, obviously, mass production and distribution for the most part is always illegal unless providing to something like a licensed distributor. But things like possession, or individual use is a big gray area in many states still, and usually the most common situation to run into. Especially when personal use mixes with other potentially dangerous situations that throw everyone for a loop. So 30-year-old Kenman Chan decided to take a trip to the Dominican Republic in late January of 2010. He is a concept artist that's in the film industry in San Francisco, and he saw a golden opportunity a global information networking conference. See, maybe I am taking it the direction. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes corporate Danielle again. <laughs> it was being held in the Dominican Republic where he could benefit his career and enjoy a tropical vacation all at the same time. Now, this trip did go as planned. He had a great time and left with a ton of knowledge ready to tackle work head on. So on January 31st, he boarded one of his last legs of his trip connecting U.S. Airway Flight 1447, heading out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with sunny Los Angeles as the destination. Everyone boarded the sleepy, multi-hour flight with hopes for it to pass as quickly and seamlessly as possible, but this flight did not go as planned. Upon boarding the flight, the flight attendants made their way down the aisle, performing their typical checks. They described the safety instructions, double-checked everyone was buckled in, but there was one passenger that just kept throwing up a bit of a red flag. Kenman Chan. As they made their rounds, Kenman kept eerily gazing up at them. He would flash a bizarre smile that made them uncomfortable and even waved at them a handful of times, which to some may seem like completely average behavior, but after 9-11, flight attendants are that much more aware of anything that feels slightly off, and this guy definitely felt a little bit off. As they kept a closer eye on him, they continued to notice some more strange behavior. The man was sitting in his seat. He was flashing his eyes back and forth, and the, you know, on the plane, he was making odd hand gestures. He appeared to put his hands up in a praying position a few times, and then he would go back to just smiling at all the flight attendants and surrounding passengers. Now, this continued on for the duration of the pre-flight checks, but it wasn't quite enough for flight attendants to feel unsafe at this point, so they all buckled in for liftoff and hoped all would go well. And everything was fine until they noticed this same man get up out of his seat immediately after they made it up in the air. Kenman Chan headed from his seat to the back of the plane and he entered the bathroom. And as soon as the door shut, he began to scream at the top of his lungs. Whoa. Everyone on the plane was horrified yeah. and obviously confused as flight attendants who were already very wary of his behavior rushed to check out the situation. The door was locked and Kenman just continued to scream and seemingly throw himself all against all of the walls in this tiny restroom. The flight attendants repeatedly knocked on the door to try to calm him down and encourage him to come out while also trying to keep the other passengers calm. Within a few moments, the door flew open and Kenman rushed out with his shirt untucked and his pants still at his ankles. The bathroom had every single compartment in it open, and at this point, nobody knew what was going on. So, I mean, we know that somewhere along the way, marijuana is involved. But if you're thinking about it from their perspective at the time, you're talking about a man that's been giving creepy smiles to passengers, weird hand gestures as if he may be trying to communicate with someone, runs to the bathroom screaming, comes out half undressed. You know, I can imagine what they're probably thinking because my anxiety brain was like, okay, 
if all the compartments are open, I'm thinking he's flushed a bomb down the toilet, like <laughs> he's hidden right. something somewhere. So you can understand why at this point they are losing their minds. So the flight attendants, as they were, uh, you know, attempting to calm him down, they were trying to get him back to a seat so they could further assess the situation. But it only got worse. Kenman refused to go back to his seat. And when one of the flight attendants tried to usher him back gently, he became violent. Mm. Kenman started throwing elbows. Mm. But what Kenman didn't know is that he was throwing elbows at the wrong person. The flight attendant that he was messing with was 51-year-old Miss Gorman. <laughs> Okay. And that's how you know someone means business when, when they're referred to as Miss something yeah, <laughs> in I, all I, articles. I think that was my third grade teacher, but yes. I know. She was my neighbor. <laughs> she scared me. <laughs> but Miss Gorman also happened to be a fourth degree black belt. Uh-oh. Uh Miss -oh. Gorman immediately ducked all of Kenman's violent elbow throws and decided that she needed to physically subdue him. With her black belt history, she knew the first thing that she needed to do was secure his arms. So she decided to put him in an arm lock. Now, after successfully grabbing one arm, she attempted to get his other and was even jumping onto the tops of airplane seats in an attempt to do so. And keep in mind, there's people all around. They've just lifted off. Yeah. At this point, Kenman made his entire body stiff. And all the passengers on the plane are thinking, this is about to go down, horrible things are happening. And after a few failed attempts, Miss Gorman realized the only option she had left was a chokehold. Uh -oh. So she flipped him toward the seat. She's literally crouching on top of the seat, reached in from behind and grabbed him long enough to force him into being still. By this point, other flight attendants had made the captain aware of the situation and they brought Miss Gorman some plastic handcuffs to secure Kenman to the seat while they prepared to take further action. The plane, as you can imagine, was immediately diverted <laughs> and yeah. it had to make an emergency landing in Pittsburgh due to this unruly passenger. Once they landed, authorities entered the plane, took Kenman and handed him over to the FBI because again, they still have no clue what he did in the bathroom or why he was behaving this way. But Kenman told the FBI that this was all a huge misunderstanding. He admitted that he did behave oddly well on the plane and that he did, in fact, try to elbow the flight attendants that were taking him back to his seat. However, he said he also knew where he went wrong. Uh -oh. He ate one too many marijuana cookies. What? Liter literally. Uh, now, hold on a second. I was thinking, first of all, I was concerned this guy was having a medical event of some kind, mm -hmm. you know maybe an aneurysm or something that's yep. effective affecting his brain. Yep. Well, clearly it was something that was affecting his brain. But the other thought that came to mm -hmm. mind is what if he was trying to smuggle something like he was trying to smuggle a bunch of LSD and he had it in balloons that he had swallowed or, you know, mm -hmm. like one of those weird situations, but a, a pot cookie. Exactly. But that's why this story like blew my mind. And that's what I meant at the start where I was like, what happens when you have someone that it could be simply it's just, you know, possession or something. And it yeah. pairs with something that makes it seem Seem like it could be way worse. Yeah, yeah. So Kenman began to explain that he was from San Francisco originally, and he was on this long trip back from the Dominican Republic. And he said that in San Francisco, he had a prescription medical marijuana card. Okay. Typically, he always took the dose that was recommended, but he decided before a long flight from Philadelphia to LA that he would take twice the dose. So he he quite literally did eat one too many marijuana cookies. He ate two instead of one. And he figured there wouldn't be any repercussions. I'm assuming, you know, he's like, oh, maybe I'll just sleep more or... Right. He probably didn't think he was going to, you know, freak out. Yeah. Go, <laughs> go into a psychosis. Bit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. However, sometime around boarding the flight, things hit him in a different kind of way that they never had before. He realized that he was acting strangely, but couldn't really state why. He remembered going into the bathroom and freaking out, but he did claim that once he went into the bathroom that he snapped back to reality. However, it was still after this that he came out pantsless throwing elbows. <laughs> he stated that he never had any negative intentions and he didn't plan on causing trouble. But FBI agents still took him in. He went to Allegheny County Jail, and they charged him with felony interference with flight crew members and attendants, a crime that could land him with 20 years in prison as well as $250,000 in fines, literally overeating one too many cookies. Wow. But the state decided that wasn't enough, and they added another layer of charges on top of that as well. The state that or the state charged Kenman with disorderly conduct. Mm -hmm. And I've also seen, and I could not 
for sure find the information on this, but it seems like he was also possibly charged with indecent exposure because he came out of the bathroom without his pants on. Right. Uh, but obviously this became pretty large news in the area. Pretty much anything that happens on a flight like that just blows up. And many questions were raised about medical marijuana and the use of it state to state, especially while you're you know, traveling by plane. Some also question the legitimacy of it because this was 2010. And right. at this point, it wasn't really heard of as often that someone had a medical marijuana card. I feel like now we wouldn't question it, but this was a while ago. Now, a spokeswoman for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Pittsburgh did end up looking into all of this, and she came forward and made a statement that the medical marijuana card was legally issued, and it was for a legitimate health issue that Kenman struggled with. And I tried really hard to find it, and I'm happy I found out what it was because the lawyer wouldn't say what it was, uh, she wouldn't say what it was, but he apparently struggled with carpal tunnel. Okay. Uh, well, I was trying to see if it connected in any way to the flight or anything like that, but... Well, having the um, having the stewardess put you yeah. in an arm lock, I'm sure didn't yeah. help the carpal tunnel. <laughs> yeah, probably not at all. Maybe that's why he like threw elbows instead of punches. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm being so serious. <laughs> But at the same time, too, friends of Kenman's became to come out of the woodwork making statements. This was, like I said, pretty big news, and he was being charged at a federal level. So many people were understandably shocked, especially because his friends knew him as one of the calmest, most gentle human beings. Many of them stated that he was a very responsible businessman. He typically kept to himself and he wouldn't hurt a fly. They couldn't all imagine him acting the way that he was described as acting. They also said that they were shocked because they had no clue that he used any drugs at all. And a lot of them said that he never acted like a pothead. Right. right. Direct statement, which I personally chuckled at a little (laughs) bit when I read it. (laughs) I didn't know he acted like a pothead. Yeah, he wasn't, uh, you know, eating a bag of potato chips or playing guitar with little circular (laughs) sunglasses on. Exactly. I thought that was so funny when I read it. But by... Tuesday, following the incident, this happened on a Sunday, Kenman was released on bond to await his federal and local trials. But while he was trying to wrap his head around his actions, and, you know, as long as, as well as those that knew him, Miss Gorman was actually being applauded for hers. Yeah. So Miss Gorman didn't actually do a lot of interviews after this fiasco, but her mom took this as like a prime opportunity to talk up her daughter. <laughs> Miss Gorman had apparently always wanted to go into the Navy's flight program. Her dream was to protect the country and do so from the sky. But unfortunately, while she was in college, she kind of missed the age cutoff by just a tiny bit. So her time came and went. Hmm. So she decided after this to settle in as a flight attendant. And she also just so happened to have a passion for Taekwondo. So she spent many years mastering it. And she had only just received her fourth degree black belt literally right before this happened. And even more interesting, she took a class after 9-11 with her grandmaster to train um, on dealing with performing in small spaces, specifically for being on a plane. I was wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, those aisles are tiny. And to your point, you know, she's stepping up on. <laughs> she did. She flipped up on a seat in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, despite not making the Navy's flight program, she still managed to protect people from the sky as a flight attendant. Granted, it wasn't as serious of a situation as it was initially believed to be, but she still did exactly what her gut told her to. And if it hadn't been a man that simply ate too many marijuana cookies, she could have easily saved everybody on that plane with her fast acting and skills that she had learned outside of work. So huge applause to her. Yeah, she's yeah, still exactly. helping to diffuse the situation and people are worried about what's going on. And mm-hmm. if they see someone that's being out of control and they're not being handled, who knows? You could have had another medical event. There could have been someone that has exactly. a heart attack that's just watching or something. Yeah, so, from the fear. Yeah. I thought she just she did a great job. So I had to add that in about her because I was clapping the whole time. <laughs> but Kenman, on the other hand, was still facing the federal and state level charges. He decided to waive his right to a preliminary hearing. And after a year, in May of 2011, he was finally sentenced. Now, despite originally possibly facing 20 years in prison, he ended up only being sentenced to five months of probation. Hmm. His attorney explained that Kenman really was a peaceful and gentle guy. This was very out of character for him. He had a total lack of history when it comes to criminal record. And the judge said that his crime likely occurred because of ingesting just way too much pot and having no idea that it was going to affect him like that. So I think they felt for him a little bit. And 
I, other than the five months, he actually did have to pay restitution to the airline. I think it was like six thousand eight hundred or so dollars because they did have to divert the plane due to his behavior. Oh yeah. But yeah. this really goes to show how one small decision can land you in a whole lot of unexpected trouble <laughs> and really yeah. make you question eating that second cookie. <laughs> Definitely. Well, and there's another important aspect to all of that. Um, I believe back at that time, the edibles didn't have any way to measure how much mm -hmm. was in it. Yeah. I know that now there's measurements, mm -hmm. uh, although some of the articles I was seeing were like, hey, they this measurement says this much is in there. We're actually finding that it's this much. In most cases, it was less. So yeah. it seems like the standards that they've set for labeling these types of things has changed significantly mm -hmm. now that we have more and more states coming online for legal use. But uh, back in 2010, I bet there was no type of measurement on those cookies at all. And who even knows if they're consistent from one cookie to the next? Like, well, that just... was, yeah, that was my biggest question. You know, it's obviously if he went to the extent of getting his medical marijuana card, this was something that he, you know, typically would do. He would typically yeah. use these edibles in order to help with his pain enough so to where he felt comfortable taking, you know, a second dose. Right, right. And so all I was thinking was, how did it go from zero to 100 so absolutely fast? And I was kind of thinking something along those same lines as I don't think at the time they were able to for sure say, hey, this cookie and this cookie or this edible and this edible have the same amount in them, you know, that the levels are the same. So he could have easily triple or quadruple dosed without even knowing it. Right, right. And on, on top of that, um, I did bump into some information looking into side effects and stuff like that. Um, extreme paranoia mm -hmm. can can be a side effect and I, I do believe certain forms of psychosis can also be a side effect and it seems like um this this might have been what happened to this guy wow that's you almost it's weird because you feel bad for him yeah. in one way yeah. you know but also hey you kind of set yourself up for this in another way you know I, mean, I know like this whole thing literally over a cookie <laughs> like one yeah. singular cookie and I wish I could have found too. He never stated from what I saw why he chose to do that. And, you know, at that point, probably not to help with his carpal tunnel. <laughs> it was no. probably, you know, to get him through the flight, which, okay, I get it. But yeah. Yeah. like the level of fear that caused in so many people, like I kept sitting when I was researching and thinking about the level of chaos happening in that plane. Like this man, I mean, he was like holding his hands up to pray. He was sending like hand signals. Imagine sitting in your seat peacefully just after takeoff and just hearing someone scream at the top of their lungs in the bathroom yeah. and then watching someone just be chokeholded in the middle of the aisle. Like it's, I can't imagine what a lot of those people were thinking at the time, you know, oh my goodness. And to know it was over something that so easily could have been avoided is infuriating. <laughs> so I do feel bad for him, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, good grief. Come on now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but poor guy. Thank you to the Gazette, CBS News, FBI.gov, NBC San Diego, and SanFranciscoGate.com for all the information on this story. Yeah. Yeah. Good work on that, Danielle. Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I want to touch on. I think I think you've you've covered it all. You, you mm -hmm. hit it all. No mm -hmm. criminal record before. Uh, nope. You didn't find anything that's happened since then, right? No, not at all. Okay. Everything was very quiet after that. Yeah. I was actually surprised it took so long for him to be sentenced. Hmm. It took it took quite. A, I was expecting it to go a lot faster than that. Yeah, yeah. It was just I will never get over that whole entire. He didn't look like a pothead. <laughs> well, this isn't that 70s show it's right. not that obvious all the time <laughs> right right exactly um where you might feel bad for the man in that story don't know if you're going to necessarily feel the same way about the guy in my story so uh we're going to get to that but first we got to get through this very quick commercial break well, John, we're always going head to head on our show. How about we see who can give our audience the best reasons to check out HelloFresh? Oh, I'm pretty sure I've got this. Number one, they simplify my life by cutting out stressful meal planning. Their no contact delivery brings a box right to my door. Everything I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. 
that's not bad, but for me, it's the fact that they have more than 25 recipes featured every week. And with their awesome step-by-step -step recipe sheets, I have a delicious meal and not a sink full of dirty pans. Last night, I had gnocchi with spinach and heirloom tomatoes. It was like I was at my favorite Italian food restaurant, but I didn't have to do the drive or cover a steep bill at the end of it. It was great. Eating healthier has never been easier with low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options. Four out of five customers say HelloFresh helps them lead a healthier lifestyle. Every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers, and you won't be overbuying produce. They send the perfect amount for the recipes, which is easier on the planet. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime12 and use code CrimeAfterCrime12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. I think it's a tie, John. We need our listeners to weigh in by giving Crime After Crime's number one sponsor a try. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime12 and use code CrimeAfterCrime12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. We promise you are going to love HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Welcome back, everybody. Now, I definitely had an interesting story, and I find it interesting that we're going to feel sorry for my guy, but not so sorry for yours, John. So that has my head kind of spinning a little bit. I'm curious to know what terrible thing he did. Well, <laughs> buckle up, Danielle. Uh, we're going to get into it right now. Okay. Now, according to several online sources, because I have no direct experience to know anything about this, <clears throat> marijuana can have several effects outside of the intended good ones, such as heightened senses and that blissful euphoria. It can also bring about changes in mood, slowed judgment, impaired memory, impaired thinking, and difficulty with problem solving. It seems that James Russell Clark experienced all of those aspects in today's story oh, no. with maybe a little extra dose on the impaired thinking. Bozeman, Montana is frequently called the most livable place thanks to its numerous outdoor activities, dramatic mountain ranges, and impressive wildlife. It's such a beautiful place, it served as a filming location for several films, including A River Runs Through It. The 2010 census had Bozeman's population just over 37,000, but by 2019, the population had increased to nearly 50,000 residents, and it stands as the fourth largest city in Montana. Some might say the population is growing like a weed. <laughs> Around 1 p.m. I am a child. <laughs> I put it in there for you, Daniel. Yeah, if, if you're the only person that I laughs, it's fine. I genuinely appreciate it. <laughs> I'm perfectly happy if you're the only person that laughs. <laughs> Around 1 p.m. on Saturday, January 25th, 2020, local law enforcement received a very troubling call. A group of unsupervised children was seen throwing axes near a home on North 6th Avenue. Two were described as middle-aged or middle school aged, not middle aged children. That'd be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, two were described as middle school aged, but one was a toddler. And the person calling it in said that one of the children was also carrying a gas can. This seems safe. <laughs> now, if this was taking place in North Carolina, I'd be asking, Danielle, were your kids throwing axes and carrying gas cans around outside lately? <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, I was trying to like keep my mouth shut, but that is actually something pretty typical in North Carolina. I do have axe and knife throwing in my backyard. So this is... <laughs> See? This is a, this is normal for North Carolina. No one would have bat an eye. <laughs> I mean, I know. I know axe throwing is a thing. I know there's places you can go to. It's like a big date night thing. Yeah. It shows up on TV all the time. Hey, honey, um, you want to go throw axes together? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I don't know if you should let your kids do it on their own. No, probably uh, not. Uh, as the police officers approached the home, uh, a child opened the front door, and the officers noticed a very strong smell of marijuana coming from inside the house. The officer also noticed a man in the home and asked to speak to him. 38-year-old James Russell Clark stepped outside. They noticed his eyes were red and glassy. And when they looked up his criminal history, they felt even a little more confident about their observations. James had previous charges for at least four DUIs, criminal endangerment, and possession of dangerous drugs. He was also 
currently on active probation. The responding officers contacted his probation officer, who requested that they conduct a search of the home. James apparently overheard some of that conversation while they were talking to his probation guy. Uh, He figured out that it seems like a search is about to happen, so he cuts back inside real quick, has a few words with his children, and then rushes back out. As police were preparing for the search, one of them heard strange noises in the garage, like trash bags being rustled. James was... Yeah, I wonder what's going on. (laughs) James was also quickly becoming agitated. He attempted to re-enter the home, but the police stopped him. They wound up having to handcuff him due to his more and more aggressive behavior. There's another one of those side effects, mood Mm -hmm. changes. Uh, The police entered the home and began looking. One officer found a door inside the home that led to the garage, but it was locked from the garage side. So he then went around to the outside garage door and opened it up. There, he saw one of James's middle school-aged children coming out of an attic crawl space. And in that same crawl space, they would later find a large bag of marijuana up there. James's other middle school-aged child just froze when the officer opened the door. He was standing on a pile of scattered marijuana leaves. So the officer directs the kids out of the house. Get out. What are you guys doing? They're like, y'all, come on. (laughs) They found marijuana all over the house. Uh, It was all in different states of growth and manufacturing processes. There was a mason jar with 35 grams found in James's dresser. 1.6 pounds of ground up shake was found in a grocery bag. Several other bags were found where marijuana was being dried out. Some bags were found where it was being converted to hash oil, including one hash batch that was being made specifically in a pink backpack. I read that in the police report. Um, Police noted seeing marijuana just literally all over the home, including on the floors, kitchen counters. Uh, They also found empty and full large bags of potting soil in both James's car and in the house. So James was placed on probation hold. And as he was being prepped to be taken to a local detention center, he admitted to officers that he had told two of his eldest children both of which who were under the age of 14 to try to get rid of the marijuana. He specifically told them, we need to get rid of that crap. That crap is in my effing garage. Seems that impaired judgment and problem solving was firmly gripped on James's brain. Uh, There was marijuana all over the home. (laughs) He was just very concerned about the garage. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you're telling two of your three kids to clean it up, like, with a few minutes before the police are coming in to start their search. Like, there's that much, you know? Like, there's several, like, differing levels of marijuana all throughout the home. Like, in all different kinds of bags. And you genuinely believed that, what, you're, like, 12 or 13-year-old? with Like, my daughter has a hard time and misses things just cleaning up her bedroom. (laughs) So I find it very interesting that he genuinely thinks his children are capable of getting rid of all of that. Even if it was two adults. I know. It's just, it's so much. come on. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's uh, not only was it probably not a smart idea in terms of asking two kids to magically make all this disappear within a few minutes. uh, He also wound up probably tacking on some other charges. Oh, yeah. We'll get to that. Uh, James wound up telling officers that he was breaking down the marijuana plant for his girlfriend, but the boys had a different story when they were asked about it. They said that they found it dumpster diving the day before, and they they brought it home. So much of the story is concerning, (laughs) but that may be one of the most concerning parts about it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, because now we have dad saying one thing, which honestly... Pretty believable, maybe. You yeah. know, his girlfriend had a plant and yeah, he was breaking it down for her. But now the kids who were already trying to cover for their dad by trying to magically get all this marijuana hidden are now also still trying to cover for dad by, hey, we went oh. dumpster diving and yeah, These we found this. Poor kids. <laughs> I know. I feel sorry for them. I do. Yeah. I mean, if they did find it, I'm, I'm wondering where, where that dumpster was. I don't know. For real. <laughs> I'm confused. I know. Who would leave? I don't know. Uh, so James Clark was arrested. His bail set at $75,000. He was ordered to not have unsupervised visits with his children until the case uh, concluded. 
which raises an interesting question, and I couldn't find really any social information on this case. I'm just wondering what the heck their mother thought about all this. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Yeah, um, I couldn't find any information, um, but uh, probably wasn't too happy about it. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be <laughs> like a pretty at all pretty important consideration. He was hit with four felony charges of dangerous drug possession, producing dangerous drugs, tampering with evidence, and criminal child endangerment. Uh, according to the formal complaint, quote. Clark committed the offense of tampering with physical evidence by instructing his children to impair the availability of evidence and slow the investigation of the production, manufacturing, and possession of the dangerous drug, marijuana. They certainly like to use the term dangerous drug in all this paper. Yeah. I, and I, I looked through, it was like an eight-page document, and every time they bring it up, the dangerous drugs, the dangerous drugs, the dangerous yeah. drugs, marijuana. Um... <laughs> I think the most dangerous aspect outside of James having his children around this and making them a part of his criminal act is the fact that he could actually face 25 years in prison and fines totaling well over $50,000. As a matter of fact, there was a bunch of online backlash that I mm -hmm. saw around one of the news stories because a lot of people were like, wait, we have people that kill other people in DUI accidents and they get yep, like six they years get less than that. <laughs> yeah. But we've got a guy here and it's weird because the people supporting him were really kind of stripping the story down to just him having a bunch of weed. Yeah. And it's a little more than that because you've got the whole aspect with the children that's wrapped up in this. But... Yeah. Which is a huge issue. And it's, it's very important to notice that. <laughs> yeah. And not his first set of charges. I mean, yeah, this is exactly. a guy with, yeah, with, with a criminal past as well, but in February, uh, he stood before Judge Holly Brown and pleaded not guilty. According to the Bozeman Daily Chronicle, court documents stated that he was now saying that the marijuana did actually come from dumpster diving. Are and, you serious? Yeah, yeah. Even though he had told police at the time that he was being arrested, it was my girlfriend's plant. Now, I guess, I don't know if he read that information somewhere and he's like, oh, my kid said what? That's a good idea. Yeah, it was dumpster diving. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Which I don't know how it changes anything. I mean, what, what, did you think it was a fern? I know. I mean, like, what? how does well, that change anything? Well, I thought anything? I had just discovered a huge basil plant. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, hey, I love basil. Let but me yeah, take that home. I just, I don't know. And then I'm going to take it and I'm going to just totally rip it apart. And <laughs> Yeah, but, but hold on, hold on. There's another major consideration here. He also stated... He didn't ask his kids to get rid of the stuff after the police showed up that he had actually asked them way before the cops ever showed up to the house to get rid of it. Hmm. Once again, just what, what difference? Like, <laughs> I think he's hoping that that drops the tampering with evidence charge because if he had told his kids, Hey, you clean up all that weed out in the garage. And it wasn't because he thought there was pending charges happening because the police had literally just showed up and said, oh, by the way, we're going to have to check out your house because your probation officer is telling us that we have to go in. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I just I don't understand the logic of it. But uh, it's like he's trying to push it all off on his kids being like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, actually, they did find it in the dumpster. And like, I told them naughty. <laughs> Get right, rid of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, finding public criminal records in this state was not easy. I think yeah. they have like local computers that you have to go to mm -hmm. at different places in the state. So I really couldn't find uh, much more information in terms of what happened with these charges. This was all early 2020, of course, right before the coronavirus stuff hit. Yeah. So I don't know if that postponed any of the court processes. More I did also likely, try. Yeah. 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 I also tried reaching out to a few reporters that I saw that were reporting on it, but I haven't heard anything back from them in time for this recording. But Montana does have a significant update in regards to marijuana that might have some effect on these charges. In the November 2020 elections, Montana citizens voted on Initiative 190 to legalize marijuana for recreational use and CI 118 to set the legal age for marijuana use to 21 and over. Both initiatives passed with over 56% of the vote and went into effect on January 1st, 2021. Part of the tax revenue generated from mm -hmm. marijuana sales, which was set at 20%, pretty steep tax rate yeah, on that. Yeah, I was about to say that's a little high. 
<laughs> but um, it's going to go to a lot of good things. Uh, a significant portion is going towards land, water, and wildlife conservation programs. Other proceeds going for veteran services, substance misuse treatment, which I really hope they get James into. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Health care and, of course, government operations. Okay. That's yeah. pretty good. While some people commenting online think that this may reduce his charges, I think there's a few important factors here. First off, he was on probation, you know, yeah. so the jail and fines might be steeper for these charges than if it was just like a first offense type situation. Mm-hmm. Second, in states where marijuana becomes legal, there are usually strict conditions around how much can be kept for personal use. Yeah. In Montana, you're allowed to possess one ounce of marijuana. Yeah, I think so, he was a bit over that. <laughs> I think so. Just that ju- just that one bag of shake. Yeah. Which was 1.6 uh-huh. pounds. Yep. That's about 25 times the amount that he's supposed to be able to have for personal use. And that's not counting all the other stuff that they had in his, you know, found in his drawer all over the house, the other bags where it was being mm-hmm. processed. Um, and finally... Two of these charges are related to children. Yeah. And while the tampering with evidence charge could be dropped if that argument about telling the kids to get rid of it before the police showed up were actually valid and true, which I'm not sure of either. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, really. I don't think it's really going to hold up, but uh, I really doubt that the child endangerment charge is going away. I truly just hope that the courts find a way to make sure those kids aren't subjected to anything like that again. And maybe... James will learn a big lesson that will put him on the path to becoming a, a better father, which um, I know is a big hope. It's a big ask, but I'm really hoping for it in this case. Thanks yeah. to, yeah, uh, thanks to NBC Montana, Bozeman Daily Chronicle, KBZK, MarijuanaMoment.net, TheGrowthOp.com, BailBondsHQ.com, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story. Man, that's a really sad story in my opinion because if you're a child and you're growing up in a situation like that like even if you know that what is happening isn't right kind of looking to a parent and you're expecting them to do what is right you know what i'm saying like you're expecting your parent to do what is legal and what is okay yeah. and it kind of sucks to hear that these kids are seeing and being told the exact opposite it, yeah and it, there is something heartbreaking about when they're trying to kind of like game the system because you don't know if that's coming from a place of them being supportive of their parent, mm-hmm. being fearful of their yeah, parent. Exactly. That's going to be my next point. Yeah. Being fearful of the, um, you know, the administration's organizations, government, whatever the parent's point of view is about how the world is coming after them. Yeah. Like there's so many different levels in terms of how a child could be seeing that situation and reacting to it. Yeah. And it's just um, all of that is not something that a middle schooler needs to be exposed to. That is so heartbreaking in my opinion. But at the same time, it does kind of make you worry because if this is what their parent is like, are they going to grow up to have that same mindset? You know what I'm saying? So right. then it just worries you on a whole other level. But that's just the mom and me kind of having a miniature heart attack over the situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and don't forget, I mean, think about where this story started. We, yeah. we have a, the police being kids called because outside, he, the kids access. are outside. Right. And that's like nothing compared to what they're about to go through in terms of trying to protect their dad. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, my goodness. That was quite a story. You're right. I don't really feel that bad for him. <laughs> I, was, I, don't. I was figuring. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really feel too bad for him. Yeah. Yeah, Kinman, uh, Kinman, I think wins the heart award for the. I know that uh, the poor episode. guy. I genuinely yeah. feel like he <laughs> had zero bad intentions. That poor man got stuck in such a bad situation. <laughs> yeah, I just really want to point out, Danielle, your story. It, it, it's like I'm trying to throw, I'm trying to throw the competition here, but I'm just going to come <laughs> right out. Your your story had kung fu in it, like the the <laughs> I know. all the the description for all the action and all that stuff. I loved it. I was eating it up. I was like, oh my god! Like Danielle's working action segments into her stories. Heck now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I did not expect it to take that turn. Kind of like how with your story, I did not expect it to take the turn of oh my gosh, these kids are outside. Yeah, you know, throwing axes. Like I didn't expect for it to start off like that, and then how it ended up spinning. But I remember researching this and just being like, oh, this I maybe be able to make this story. You know, maybe I can make it into something. And then it started going into detail about this woman having to just, I mean, jump over seats. She's like 
actively dodging elbow throws. I'm like, could you yeah. imagine being a someone on this plane? <laughs> Yeah, she went like and then, like Scarlett finding Johansson. out afterwards that this is not like some crazy scene out of a movie. Like he quite literally just ate an extra pot cookie. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? And then and then Black Widow showed up and took him down. I know it's such an interesting story. And the um, Miss Gorman actually is really good friends with the pilot that landed. Oh man, where was it? I have to look. I don't think I have it. What was that pilot that landed in two thousand and nine or something? He landed on like a. Oh, do you know what I'm talking about? On the about? Hudson River? Yes. She's best yeah. friends with him. <laughs> Sully, I think was his name. Yeah. yeah. It, and there was just another interesting little turn to the story. And I was over here like celebrating Miss Gorman and feeling really sad for Ken. <laughs> and I was like, this is such a bizarre story, but I'm like really here for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. Well, as usual, we've got extra stories to get to. And uh, Danielle's going to kick us off with uh, telling us a story about what some people that are turning themselves in. Absolutely. This is one story that I tried very hard to make my full story, but you can't find too much on it. But in 2016, 22-year-old Leland Ayala Deliente and 23-year-old Holland Sward were traveling from Las Vegas to Montana, carrying 20 pounds of marijuana. Now, they decided to enjoy some of their stash, which triggered, as you can imagine, a good bit of paranoia, leading them to believe that they were actually being followed by undercover police. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, so we have paranoia playing in this as well. So they pulled over. They ended up calling 911 to turn themselves in. They explained that they were being followed by numerous different police officers and that they had pulled the car over and they were putting their hands above their head and waving their arms around to try to get someone to stop. And they weren't understanding why none of these police officers would approach. Long story short, there were absolutely no cops following them. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody was following these men. The police had no idea that they were traveling along this highway with that much marijuana in their car. So they basically gave themselves away. They said that they were so cold, needed someone to come and help them. And they ended up being charged with felony trafficking of marijuana. Oh, my goodness. Wow. (laughs) It was so funny, though, because you can see the transcript of the 911 phone call. And he's like, we're so cold. And we're just waving at these police officers with our hands up in the air. And no one's coming to us. And we don't get it. Is it just like a road? There's just a nearby road where they see lights driving yeah, by. Yeah, they were like, like at an at Applebee's. <laughs> and the dispatcher is like, um, okay, so so you said you have what in your car again? <laughs> yeah, where exactly are you? We'll have someone there in just a moment. They're going to bring you some toasty socks. Exactly. She was we're like, warm oh, you up. so I've decided I'm going to send a, um, a car that's labeled to you. <laughs> She like wouldn't even admit to them, thinking they'd run that these were not real cops. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guys. Wow, she knew what she was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, wow, that's a good one. Uh, I've got some advice here. Uh, don't spend your last few bucks on scoring your bag, like uh, Danny De Jesus did. All right, now Danny was from Florida, and then he wound up having to go to a Circle K because he was craving one of those hot dogs. You know those hot dogs that spin on the rack all day. Mm-hmm. They eventually start looking like Freddy Krueger. Exactly. He, <laughs> he wanted so, one of those. Yeah. Problem was, he was out of cash, but he still had some green on him. So he offered the cashier some weed that he had wrapped up in a tissue. The cashier declined, and soon cops were on the scene arresting Danny. I'm still not sure if he was arrested for the weed or because he was trying to commit the crime of eating one of those hot dogs, though. I know. Both of them are equally as bad. And he did technically have another option to just use the hot dog tongs as a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Oh. And, and threaten his way out of the situation. <laughs> oh, absolutely. He would have made the clean getaway with all the hot dogs he wanted. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> So this one that I have is also, again, in relation to airplanes. And June, actually, this is is one of my favorite stories, probably ever. But Uh I just, I'm a huge humor person. Don't build it up too much. (laughs) So I did. I know everyone's like, wow, that was a letdown. (laughs) In June of 2015, 49-year-old Tom's River was waiting in Newark Airport to board his plane. When suddenly over the TSA, he heard his name being called. So when approached by TSA officers, he was informed that they had discovered zigzag papers in his bag, along with a very creative way to store his marijuana. He had carefully packaged little nuggets of marijuana and Mary Jane candy wrappers. What? (laughs) Like that caramel candy, Mary Jane. He was arrested for possession of marijuana and paraphernalia, but honestly, like you kind of got to, you kind of got to give it to him. 
Could you imagine him like in his room packaging all of this up, like hysterically laughing to himself that he is <laughs> wrapping his Mary Jane and Mary Jane candy wrappers? I mean, and there was a picture of it and they were just like haphazardly wrapped up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. Um, wow. Uh, you know, when I was looking at stuff for this episode, I bumped into, uh, I saw a purse or a makeup bag mm-hmm. and it literally had printing on the outside of it. It had, it had weed uh, oh my god! Like plants all over yeah. it, and it said, "Makeup bag, might be weed bag, <laughs> <laughs> could be either." I'm gonna keep yeah. you guessing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, could be makeup, could be weed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the coffee cups that are like, "Might be wine." <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! Uh, well, big warning for everyone: marijuana can impair your memory. As a man learned in Kent, Washington, his friend had a court appearance. So they went together. As they were passing through the metal detectors, a security guard stopped him. The guard had noticed a strong smell. He searched the man and found a bag with about four grams of marijuana in his front pants pocket. According to the Kent reporter, he told officers he put the weed in his pants pocket earlier in the morning and forgot it was there. It just went to the courthouse (laughs) to help support his friend. Quote, it was a stupid mistake. Everybody makes stupid mistakes. <laughs> That's like a real desperate, hopeful plea to be like, please. <laughs> right. You can hear the word right at the end of it. I know, Everyone like... makes stupid mistakes, right? <laughs> please let me go. I didn't mean it. <laughs> I just brought some to court. It's a stressful day. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that poor guy. <laughs> now, this one I had to just share. It's not necessarily a direct relation to like marijuana cause the crime you know or anything like that but i thought you guys might enjoy it so just last month 22 year old matthew Letham was arrested for misuse of 911 the 911 system and possession of marijuana Uh-oh. early one sunday morning matthew was like you know what i need a ride home who should i call 911 obviously oh, why do people do that <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> I've heard of this before. <laughs> now, when they informed him that that's not how 911 works, he cussed them out and then hung up, which, you know, this is all in line with Florida so far, which is where this all occurred. <laughs> right. An officer ended up arriving on location to check on him and offered to call him a taxi, but he refused, saying that he didn't have money for it, so he took off on foot. So clearly the next best option is to call what? 911 again. <laughs> No. <laughs> and ask for a second ride. This time, the same police uh, police officer went to arrest him, and he was, in fact, found with possession of marijuana, which is why he got both of the charges. But my favorite part about this whole story isn't just the fact that this is, like, so Florida, but the mugshot shows that this man has the state of Florida tattooed on his forehead. He has the state, like, the shape of the state? Yes. It just, like... <laughs> fully blacked out just like just a black state (laughs) of florida and it's like not even the center of his forehead it like kind of comes down in between his eyebrows to his nose which makes it even better oh my god (laughs) 911 come and help me pick me up do you think he might have been high when he got that that, that tattoo (laughs) absolutely probably high when he got the tattoo probably high when he was calling 911 to give him a ride home (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) a poor man (laughs) I mean, I have heard stories like that. I know there was one where uh, didn't a woman call police because her refrigerator was broken or something mm-hmm. and like they actually replaced like they got her a new fridge. Yep. Like, you know, it's there's those kind of nice little stories you hear every now and then. But I hear that story all the time. They called 911 for a ride. I, this not is what not there for. how yeah. this works. It's not Uber. <laughs> no. OK, well, wow. who's going to win this month? I don't know. They were both pretty dang good stories. I knew that was going to happen, but you guys are the ones that get to vote who had the best Ganja Made Me Do It story. And you can vote on our Twitter account, at Crime After Pod, for the first seven days after the episode drops, or... You can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We do have a link in the description box below. And as long as John Lord is able to fix all of our technical issues, there should be one up in the eye. Still not letting me do that. 
Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think I, don't I know did what, it. I don't know what it is. And any any of my channels, it won't let me do it. <laughs> so weird. Yeah, I think I got it done last month. Uh, at crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can also find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, which we really appreciate you guys. Mm-hmm. We're looking at those every single month. Yeah. How to join our Patreon, where you can get all the bonus episodes, over 30 more episodes where we get personal. We talk about our, our lives a little bit more about us. It's not the quite quite the same format that you get yeah. here. It's for people that are kind of more super fans, especially mm-hmm. of Danielle, let's say. Oh, boy. Uh, or <laughs> you can also shop our Teespring store all at crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. And on that note, we need to say a huge thank you to our patrons. You guys are absolutely awesome. As John said, you get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. It's a lot of fun. You learn a lot about us and you get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special when you sign up. The next episode we are doing when we come back on May 1st, craziest British crime suggested by you guys out there. And I'm going to say, Danielle, I'm going to make an official rule right now. Okay. If... Either of us tries to do a terrible British accent or says the word British. British. I'm, I'm taking a vote away for every time it happens. That's how it's going to go. Well, I'll be losing because <laughs> I already, I've already, every, even you saying that when we discussed this being a thing, my mind just immediately changed narration to a terrible British accent. So, yes, yes, it happens. <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to do it. I'm going to try to do my whole story in the voice of uh, Dick Van Dyke from Mary Poppins, which oh I understand gosh. is a terrible British accent if you ask anyone British. Oh, absolutely. I feel sorry for everyone <laughs> listening to the next episode. <laughs> We're going to have a hard time. <laughs> But you guys, this show is produced and hosted by myself, Danielle Hyland, and the wonderful John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. The best way you could help others find us is to tell them. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. We will see you guys next time. Take care. Take care.